Okay, everybody, welcome. Another, another class, another week. Getting ready for Hanukkah, one week away from Hanukkah. This is a uh, very, very interesting class. The topic we're going to discuss, we could, we could connect it to Hanukkah, we could connect it to, we could connect it to what's going on, what's going on in Israel. Very, very interesting stuff. The reason why it's so interesting, the reason why it's so relatable, it's because it's not just about a story that happens a long time ago, as discussed many times before. Every person mentioned in the Torah is a template. So you better believe that Jacob and Esau and his twin brother, they represent two very uh, dynamic and important roles, ideas that exist in humanity. So let's, let's just recap what happened in this week's Parsha. Last week we learned that... Take two. Last week we learned... That, that Jacob was in Kharan, in Iraq. And he, and he was dealing with his father-in-law. And he married Leah and Rachel and Bilah and Zilpah. And he had 12 children, 11 boys and one girl. Not bad. Then he decides, you know, enough is enough. We're dealing with love and it's time to go back home. The problem is when you go back home, back to the land of Canaan, you have to face the music with Asaph. Yaakov didn't have an easy life. I mean, he had to deal with Esau and love and Esau again. Remember, Esau wanted to kill Yaakov because Yitzchak blessed Yaakov instead of Esau. Esau wasn't too happy. So now it's been 20 years and Yaakov's not sure. Is his brother still hate him? Does his brother still want to kill him? The you know, question is, how do we deal? This is the question we're going to deal with um, on page 125. Because we are B'nai Yisrael. We are the children of Israel. Esau is an antagonist to the Jewish people. How do you deal with the naysayers? How do you deal with the haters who are against good? You're trying to be good. You're trying to have a good impact. And there, there, are, forces, there are forces opposing you. So let's, let's ask the audience for... Adam, I'm going to pick on you because you haven't been here. We'll, we'll give you the first chance to get the wrong answer. <laughs> I'd rather I'd rather like to hear from the learned men. Oh, look at that. The there you go. Very, very good political answer. Abstain. It's not, it's not the UN. You don't have to... No, no, no. What is, what is the inquiry? Look at the screen. Right here. Oh. What, how do we deal with the, with the forces that try to stop us from doing Torah and mitzvot? People, forces. Ask them the right questions and seek the answers from them. All right. Hmm. Maybe they're not, they're not looking for answers. No, we're looking for them to admit. All right, no. so some, some, some people aren't. They're never going to admit it. So, well, it's not a, really a question of admitting it. It's a question of voicing what they think and what they believe. Right. And then you know what you know whether you should what you shoot them in the head or in the heart. Do it anyway. Thank you. Do it I was anyway. Just going to say the same thing. Just keep exactly. doing what you're doing, because if you let them stop you, then for any amount of time. Yeah. Then you'll excuse me. They win, and that is not. So I, I, I think the two ideas are either either you enter into discussion or you just totally ignore them. It's hard to ignore them when they're firing rockets and flying in on ultralights, kidnapping your people. No. It's hard to ignore that. I, I told you, I told you it's relevant to, to, to modern, modern times. Okay, so uh, let's get into the Parsha and, we'll, and we'll learn, okay? We're not actually going to learn it from the an idea in the parsha. We're going to learn it from an explanation of the idea of the parsha. So we'll get it All right. Rashi. Well, Rashi is going to quote the Gemara, and that's where we're going to focus on. So yeah, Yaakov, Yaakov prepares in three ways to meet his brother. He wasn't sure. On one hand, he sa- he sends a a gift. He sends a, a tremendous, huge gift of animals and all these different things sheep and and camels and donkeys and goats and he spreads them out because he wants Esau to be 
overly impressed when he sees over the horizon, you know, one flock of after coming after the other flock and one group, he's going to, wow. And, uh, and then, uh, and number two, I, I don't know exactly in this order, uh, he prays to Hashem. He said, listen, God, you promised to protect me and now's a good time to come through on that promise. You know, call, calling a friend as the... Calling in my marker. <laughs> exactly. And number three, he prepares for war. He splits his family and his possessions into two. He figures. If Esau comes and attacks one, the other one can escape. Now, Esau wasn't somebody to be trifled with. Esau was a powerful man. He was a leader. It says he, he was coming with 400 men. Some people explain it that those 400 men were leaders of, of battalions. So Esau was coming... Esau was, coming with an, Esau was coming with an army. And Esau's intent was, was to kill. But let's look at the actual reunion. Text number 1A. Um, if you want to follow in the book, you can. Up, or on the board. Um, in the screen page, text 1A. The reunion happens is that um, when Yaakov, when Esau sees Yaakov, he runs over to him and, and he, well, Yaakov bows down to Esau. And Esau ran, uh, runs over to him and he hugs him and he falls on his neck and he kisses him. And they cry. Now, the commentaries are bothered by this. Because in the beginning of the Parsha, right at the beginning of the Parsha, why did, ya why did Yaakov prepare for war? And why did Yaakov send this whole gift? And why did Yaakov make this tearful plea to God? Well, it's because Yaakov sent messengers. That's actually the, the name of the Parsha, the Yishlach. The Yishlach Yaakov Malachim. And Yaakov sent messengers to Esav. And they came back, and that messenger said, he's out to kill you. So all of a sudden, Esau sees Yaakov, and Yaakov is, and, and, and Esau is in a good mood, and he's, and he's crying, and he's hugging him, and he's kissing him. Is, as I say in Yiddish, epis feltzich. Something's missing here. Something's in the picture. It doesn't make sense. So now, in the Torah, let's see that we have a picture here. Okay, we don't have a picture, but if, if you look at the board, in, the, in every Chumash you'll see it, as well as in the Torah, you see that word I'm pointing to there? Vayishakehu? Mm -hmm. Vayishakehu, if you notice on top of the word, it's in your book as well, there are dots. There are a few words in the Torah that have dots. Any time a word in the Torah has dots, it means there's a, there's a, a different meaning, a double meaning. You, most rabbis agree means to minimize. So, for example, we have love on when he when meets Yaakov, he kisses him also. There's a there are dots. Right? There, there are a few times it, it means uh, there are dots. Now, what what's the point? What's the point with the dots? So here's where Rashi comes in, and Rashi quotes. This is text one B. Rashi quotes um, the Gemara, and Rashi says there's an argument. Well, the Brisa. He says there's an argument. One opinion is that Esau, he kissed him and hugged him. That was an external expression of love, but inside he still hated him. But that, that whatever, you know, he felt bad for him. And whatever, whatever reason, he didn't love him. He just didn't want to kill him, which really, according to Yaakov, is fine. I think, you know, most, most Israelis, if they'll take, they'll take their position, you don't have to love us, just don't try to kill us. Right, that's we'll, we'll take it. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, the Rashbi, you know, who, who we celebrate on Lagba Omer, a very famous man. We're going to talk about him a lot in today's class. He says the halach is, and it's interesting because in English they translate it as tradition. It's not a good translation because halacha means the law is, and the law is super rational. It means the hate. That Esav has to Yaakov is, is super rational. It doesn't make sense. There is no reason behind this anti-Semitism. For all these years, many people have tried to explain away why is there anti-Semitism. So Rabbi Shimon Baruchai says there is no logic to it. Anti-Semitism doesn't have a logic. Bigotry doesn't have a logic. There is no reason. But I, what happened over here? At this time, this was the exception. Esav was filled with was filled with um, compassion and mercy and love, and he and, and, and he kissed him. That's that's the that's what Rashi says. All right, okay. 
So the question is, according to Shimon Bar Yochai, I mean, according to the first opinion, it makes sense. Esav hated him a lot, wanted to kill him, and then Esav didn't hate him so much. Fine. But according to Shimon Bar Yochai, Esav went to 180. He went from wanting to hate him to the point he wanted to kill him, and then he hugs him and he kisses him with a full heart. Why? What changed? Right? Number one. Number two, let me see if the questions are here. Um, do you see, uh, they, they put a picture of the tear, but they didn't put any with, with the dots, which is kind of ridiculous. All right. Is there, is there any pictures there with that? With, word with the dot? No. No. All right. Doesn't make a difference. So now, another thing is, if you notice, going back over here, another thing you notice, the Rashi quotes Amar B'Shem Bayechai. If you look at most Rashis, sorry, go back. Most Rashis, Rashi all the time quotes the Talmud. Rashi doesn't make up his own interpretations. Rashi is always quoting the Talmud, quoting a Medrash, quoting someone else. Rashi's, I, Rashi's job is to explain, to help us understand the text based on explanations passed down throughout the generation. Most Rashis don't give you the name of the rabbi. Why does Rashi... Look, look at the first, by the way, here. In the first in the first opinion quoted by Rashi, it just says, some interpret it to say it means this. Why by the second guy, second um, explanation, does it tell us who said it? Why is it important to know who said it? Understand the question? Yeah? Okay. We're, we're going to get it. Right. So this is the question we're going to... So in order to understand this question, we, we, in order to understand what changed, we first got to understand why Rashi quotes Rabbi Shem Barichai. Who was Rabbi Shem Barichai? You guys know... I'm sure you guys know there's a bonfire, we make a barbecue, and we have marshmallows and fireworks, and we have a lot of fun. All thanks to Rabbi Shem Barichai. I don't know who he is, but thank you. He must have been a fun guy. He must have been a fun guy, right? He, he, he liked camping. Oh, my shrooms. He... He liked, uh, he, he, he owned the first, uh, what's that, uh, fishing, Bass Pro Shop, right? Bass Pro Shop. Yes, that's why. <laughs> so, so Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai lived at a very, very volatile time in Jewish history. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai lived at the time after the destruction of the Second Temple, where the Roman persecution was at an all-time high. After 50 years after the destruction of the Second Temple, the Jews mounted a rebellion, the Bar Kochba Rebellion. And was put down very heavily um, by Hadrian, the king. And he did a lot of things to make Jewish life miserable. Well, he pl we know he plowed the Temple Mount. And he outlawed public Torah study. Rabbi Kiva died for that. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai lives in this, in, the, in, in this time period. So, the, the, so Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai is known for a few stories. One of the stories you see in text 3a. Here it says... Um, this is this is the cave. The picture on the on the on the screen is a picture of the cave in Miron. Miron is a small, tiny hilltop town. It's right next to Tzvat. And the, the, and painted over here is the words Kiloisi is shachach me pizare. It will not. The Torah will not be forgotten from uh, from, the, from the from the from the Jewish people. And if you look at the, the large letters here, so Yud Aleph Yechai. This is this is his name. I like one. Hey. Um, so so who is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai? So one of the stories we have is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai was sitting with two with two other guys, Yosi ben Shimon and Yehuda ben Gait and Yehuda ben Gait and Yosi ben Gait and 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 Yosi Yosi said, um, Yosi yeah. Oh sorry, Yehuda said. The Romans did such great things. They, they, they um, made infrastructure and roads and bathhouses and all these different things. Rabbi Yassi didn't agree, didn't disagree. He was like Alan. He abstained. Rabbi Yechanan, sorry, Rabbi Shimon Be'echai said, the Romans, you think they're doing it because they like us? They're doing, it, they're doing it for their own goods. If you see, you see, he said, everything they established, they established only for their own purposes. They established marketplaces to place prostitutes in them, bathhouses to pamper themselves, and bridges to collect taxes. 
So this guy, Yehuda, um, Yehuda um, went and he said, oh, I heard about this conversation. And this conversation, well, he didn't go to the, he didn't go to the authorities, but you know, he told over a conversation, a private conversation, which he shouldn't have. It went, it got back to the Romans. The Romans said, Yehuda, who praised the Romans, he's going to be the head of the yeshiva, the head of the academy. Rabbi who, Yossi, who didn't, who didn't agree or disagree, he is going to be exiled to the north, to Tsipori. And Rabbi Shimon, who, who denigrated the Romans, he's going to be killed. So now what happened was, look at the, I think it's text 3b. Yeah, so what happened was Rabbi Shimon and, and his son had to go into hiding. So first they hid in the yeshiva. And, but then the Romans put on the squeeze to catch them. And Rabbi Shimon's wife would bring them, him and his, Rabbi Shimon and his son, Rabbi Lazar, food every day. But Rabbi Yechidon was, Shimon Rabbi Yechai, sorry, was, was worried that Romans would torture his wife into giving up their position. So without, no, without telling his wife, he snuck away from the, from the yeshiva. And he, him and his son stayed in the cave for 12 years. And they, and they, they dug themselves into the sand and they would, they would learn Torah the entire day. They, they were covered in sand until the shoulders. And when it came time to daven, they would uh, get out of the sand and they would put on their, put on their clothing. And Hashem made a miracle that a stream of water flowed next to the cave and, and a boxer tree. Boxer is a carob, C-A-R-O-B. You know what boxer is, Alan? You know what carob is? Oh, okay, because uh, some, some people don't know what either is. Boxer is Yiddish for carob. Remember, they would, uh, on, on Tu B'Shvat, in Lung Baimer, the custom, custom is to eat carob. You know, someone, someone asked, once asked, how is it possible to live 12 years on carob? So actually, science came out that carob is very, very, very healthy. It had a lot of nutrients and everything else. I think if you go into a GNC or one of these people, uh, when people walk in, they're always like, ah, Jackie Mason says, it's a crack, it's a hug. They're eating carrots, they can't see, right? Um, he says, says, you see carob supplements, whatever it is. So then, after 12 years, the, the, uh, Malio, the prophet comes and tells them, uh, announces the entrance to the cave, who's going to tell Roshim Beichai and his son that, that uh, the decree is over. He comes, he comes out of the cave. Now, you would think, you would think that the Romans, the Romans hated their Roshim Beichai. But actually, Roshim Beichai had some successful interactions um, w- 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 with the Romans. When, when the Romans passed a very, a very severe decree against learning Torah and, and against, um, against Shabbos and against, uh, and against Bris Mila and, um, and, uh, and, and uh, some, other, some other private, invasive private laws, they, need, they wanted a rabbi to go and to, and to advocate on their behalf. Who do they choose? Look at text number four. The Gemara and Me'ilah tell the crazy story. They chose Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai. Who shall go with him? Rabbi Lazar ben Yesi. And, and the Gemara tells a crazy story. As, as they're going, they, 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 they encounter a demon. His name is Ben Temalyan. And he says, shall I help you? And Rabbi Shimon laments. He said, you know, that, that in, in the Torah, we learn that Avram's maidservant Maidservant, that's why. Maidservant merited to see a, 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 an angel multiple times. And me, who, who do I have to rely on? This guy. But the Gemara tells a story how, how, the, how the, the, the emperor's daughter was possessed. And, and, and Shimon Ba'echai cured her. And then, and then they asked Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai, what can we give you as a reward? And they brought him to the, to, to the, to the storehouse or where they keep the documents. And he found the decree and he tore it up. So we see here that Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai had a, an effect on, on people. Now, what, what was it we see over here, Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai is saying, talking about that he's talking to a demon and he's lamenting that an angel should appear to him. And Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai was, I mean, he's very obviously a very special person. We don't make a whole celebration when other rabbis pass away. You know, although it's very nice to have fireworks and, and s'mores and a barbecue and all that. What's, what is it about Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai? So it says, so you know, I know we're learning in Tanya about, about different types of people. We have a Russia, you know, an evil person doesn't do what Hashem says all the time. We have a Baini who does what Hashem says but, but has evil, evil impulses. Then we have a guy who's called a Tzaddik. A Tzaddik is a righteous person. 
righteous person is somebody who's in love with God and wants to do what Hashem says all the time. So to us, us regular people, we dump all those tzaddikim into one chalant. But the truth of the matter is not like that. Power of chalant, obviously, no? Power, thank you. Obviously. What do you, what do you think? We dump them all into one group of people. But the truth of the matter is, that's not the case. In tzaddikim, there are different levels. So for example, the Torah says about Moshe. Moshe was the greatest prophet to ever live. That means there are different levels of prophecy. Right? So in tzaddik, in righteous, there are different levels of righteous. Rabbi Shimon Bayechai was on a different level. Even amongst the, even amongst the, the, um, the rabbis, the rabbis is okay, he's on a different level. So for example, this, this Shabbos is a very special day in the Chabad calendar. Shabbos and Sunday. It's the 19th and 20th day of Kislev. It's the day the Alter Rebbe went out of jail. So why do we celebrate it? So, so what's the big deal? Alter Rebbe goes out of jail. I mean, yeah, it's, it's nice that a rabbi went out of jail. He was persecuted by... Uh, I'm sorry, I got a... Is it still recording? I got a phone call. Okay. Yeah. Um... So I mean, it's nice. It's it's nice that it's nice that a rabbi got out of prison. He was being persecuted by you know. All that's beautiful, but why are we making why are we making such a uh, such a big deal? Because the Alter Rebbe represented advancement of Judaism, good over evil, and the, and the Alter Rebbe was the prototypical Jew. He was the Nasi, the leader of the Jewish people. They weren't just trying to put this rabbi in prison. They were trying to close down Judaism. So when the Alter Rebbe went out of, out of jail, it represented something. Now, amongst the Alter Rebbe's friends, and Alter Rebbe had some heavy hit friends, Levi Yitzchak Bardiche, Valdi Malach of Lezhensk, Zosha of Anapoli, Menachem Mendel Hader Docker. I mean, someone actually gave me a book not too long ago. Don't steal the book. It's, it's behind me, it's on the top shelf. It's an encyclopedia of, of, uh, of Hasidic personalities. All the famous, not only famous, everybody, it's in that book. It's unbelievable. We have three, four hundred years of Hasidic history, isn't it? Yeah, but how far, far forward does it go? I think it was, it was written in, in our century. Pretty, I shouldn't say 400 years. Baal Shem only started Hasidus in 1734. Anyway, so, um, so even amongst the rabbis, the holy men of, of the 1700s, they, realized, they said the Alter Rebbe was a different breed. So let's go to the next story of Rabbi Shem Baruchai so you'll underst- you kind of understand... What, what, what we mean by that? You missed the whole demon possession part, though. You want me to spend more time on that? I saying it was interesting, and you never touched on it. I, I didn't say that. I said she was possessed. I, I said for a he second. Was, he met skipped the it. demon on the road. No, he no. said, okay, I'll come help you. He possessed the daughter just so they could vanquish it, and yeah. then get to the, the decree. Okay, yeah, so. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting. How many caves were we talking about? One particular cave? One particular cave. That's a, one of our trips way back in the 70s. They pointed out a cave and they said that was the cave. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Is there a stream next to it? Um, yeah, there was a stream. There was also um, another it, cave. Is there a carob tree? A tree, I can't remember. But there was a. Um, so let, let me just tell you a story. Where they, where they stored oil and wine within the cave. Well, I would be, no, was, Rabbi, Shirin by your, Rabbi Shirin Bayer Chai and, and his son did not have oil and wine. Okay. Well, so I, I'll just tell you a story about, about travel, about uh, tour guides. <laughs> they my, embellish? My friend told me the yeah. story. The story happened to him. So he went on a tour of Jerusalem and he came to a certain place. He said, This is where Samuel the prophet's buried. So he loved the tour. So, you know, the next day he had some time. He said, I'm going to go on the same tour again. So interesting. He went back. The guy said, I said, this is where Samuel is buried. He said, whoa, 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 I was here yesterday and I was told different place. That's Samuel 1. This is Samuel 2. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm not saying, I'm not saying everything they're saying is false. I'm not just saying not everything they say is true. Again, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if they know where the cave is. It could be they do. I don't know. No, they can say anything they want. So it was a nice looking cave. It's in Israel. Israel. <laughs> we know from the story of Hanukkah, Israel is a place of caves. Mm-hmm. I mean, all the Maccabees hid out in caves. So There's a lot of caves there. A lot of caves. A lot of caves. Uh, so Alan wanted me to go back. I mean, I, I, kind of, I kind of 
Skimmed. I, I skimmed over it, and it's truth that I, sh I shouldn't because this kind of so proves. Like a cave tour, exactly. We're, 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 well, we're supposed to be having we're supposed to be having a uh, an Israel trip. Um, so we actually it talks about this in the Gemara. Because Rabbi Shimon Bar was a, a rabbi from the Mishnah earlier period. The Gemara is from from the year like two hundred to six hundred. Shimon Bar Yechai lived, you know, the year like a one hundred around there ish. I think I hope I'm saying the right time. I'm saying, or uh, I think he lived that after the, the destruction. You can check in our timeline book. So the Gemara, rabbi, one of the rabbis in the Gemara says, "How come we don't? See, you see these stories of Shimon Bar Yechai seeing demons, talking to demons, and this and that. How come we don't see it?" Because um, they said they were a different caliber of people. We can't handle such such revelation. But Rishim Bar was able to talk, was able to talk, was able to converse with them, was able to corral them, to control them. You know, the demons were coming to him. Should we should we um, should we help you? Now, demons, by the way, don't mean like you see in the movies. Guys with red horns and I don't, know, what, I don't know if my 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 image of demons is a little outdated. You know, my, my daughter, my daughter. Yeah, I think it was my daughter asking me. Said, so, you ever hear El uh, Elm Street? I say, yeah, Elm, it's a name, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's also a series of a movie. So I say, yeah, it's a, it's a yeah, I'm sure. No, it's not. I say, yeah, it is, all over the United States. You know. It was in Elm Street and everything. Yeah, it's the name of a tree. No, 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 no. I did not Elm Street. Exactly. Several of them. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, but, but uh, a demon, a demon is a spirit, a, 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 is a spirit. Just like angels are our creations, mm -hmm. demons are our spirits created from the forces of impurity that that make people tr that make people trouble. Now, unlike in modern culture or whatever beliefs believe in them, they're independent creatures. They are not independent creatures. And there are actually stories in the Gemara with demons that help Jews, like the story over here. The story Shimon Bar Yechai was at a level where they they wanted to help him, and the demon possessed the, the emperor's daughter, and and. And Reb Shimon Bechai told it to go, and the emperor was very impressed. Obviously, he had no idea this whole. By the way, if you want, an, if you want a good demon story, um, the story of Shlomo HaMalach, King Solomon, and the king of demons Ashmedai. If you ever in the mood of that stuff, it's a crazy story. Um, anyway, so Reb Shimon Bechai and his son Rabbi Lazar were in the cave for twelve years. Now, could you imagine? You focused on Torah study for twelve years straight. How what what state of holiness would you be in? <laughs> I'll tell you a story. It happened to my friend's father. My friend's father is an Israeli, big guy, and and he is you know in the sixties. He comes to the United States in the eighties, and he sees a Gentile beating up a Jew. He came from Israel. In Israel, when a Gentile beats up a Jew, you get involved. So he's a big guy. He takes the guy and he gets out of his car, clocks him. I mean, it's on camera, so I'm not going to say. He gave him a good clip mm -hmm. and he got back into the car. <laughs> you know, let's stay, axe, you know, he got back into the car. So later, later he was, later he was, uh, the guy's walking around the street, you know, as a bandage. <laughs> he was identified. And, and, uh, and now, now he's in trouble. He gets a, he gets a letter to appear in court. And so he wrote a letter into the rabbi. He says, you know, I saw a Jew in trouble. I helped him, and now I'm in trouble. You know, what should I do? The rabbi said, for the next two weeks, until your court date, you should keep Shulchan Aruch to the uh, Code of Jewish Law to the T, to the letter. He said this in his very Israeli accent. He says, if I, I was so holy, there was a fire coming out of my head. If a bird would fly over, it would get burned, and I was so holy. At the end of the story, is he shows up to court, Judge goes to him and says, where's your lawyer? So he says, what lawyer? He says, what do you mean? You don't have a lawyer? He says, no. So why not? He says, I don't know. I got a letter to appear in court. I appear in court. No one told you why? No. Okay, that's not, get out. <laughs> and the charges were dropped. <laughs> anyway, so, so imagine if we spent, you know, 12 years, the entire day, morning till night, no other distractions, learning Torah, what level we'd be on. That's regular bums like us. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai and Rabbi Lazar were already great men, holy people. In those 12 years, they reached such spiritual heights 
to the point where the only thing that mattered was godliness, spirituality. The material world had n no worth, zero. So after 12 years, they come out, of the, come out of their cave and they're walking around and what do they see? They see people doing regular everyday things. Like, I don't know, plowing or whatever it is that people did, did back then. So, so they said, how could it be that you're wasting your time plowing, sowing, reaping when you should be learning Torah? So they were at such a high level, it says, that everything they looked at, the, the plants would just wither and die. So they, all, all of a sudden they hear, they heard a, uh, I think this is actually text number four, no? Five. So, it's, they, so they, a divine voice said, when he came out of the cave to destroy my world, get back into the cave. Go back to timeout. So they were there for 12 months, and Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai said, said, listen, even a person after, he's, after he dies, the longest a person could be in hell is 12 months, right? They got it for 11 months. So they walked out. So what happened was, when they walked out the second time, Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai reached an even higher level. His son Rabbi Lazar remained the same. He still couldn't tolerate um, involvement in, in the material world. But Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai said, so it says, everywhere Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai, uh, Rabbi Lazar looked, the plants would wither, and wherever Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai looked, it would, it would be re reinvigorated. And he says, you see at the end of text number, text number five, Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai says to his son, listen, not everybody can be like you, you and I. You know, we are, we're special. Some people are regular people. You can't hold everybody to our standards. So, so you're talking about a man, you're talking about a man who's on a, on, a, on a different level. I mean, even, like I said earlier, even for great people, he was on a different level. Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai was such a holy person. And he said, and it might come off as, it might come off as, as bragging. It wasn't bragging. He was saying factually. Look at, look, look at what he says in text number six. Uh, he said, in the name of your, your, your Mio, in the name of Shimon Ba'echai, he said, I can absolve the whole entire world of judgment from sins committed from the day. I was created in, 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 until now. Why? Because his, his, entire, his entire entity was Torah, was godliness, was, was, was holiness. So every, everything the world introduced as, as anti-godliness, he was so much completely on the other side. Now, see, if you look at text number 7, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai didn't have to do any mitzvahs. Why? Because he was a godly person. It says in text number 7, it says the Torah was his, his study, was his vocation. Not that, you know, for example, Hillel, what did Hillel do? No? Anybody, what did Hillel do? Uh, great school? No. No, he graduated a few decades ago. No. No. Hey, how come they call him Bar Yochai? Because yeah. Bar is the Aramaic. Ben, yeah. it's the same thing. Ben is Hebrew, Bar is the Aramaic. Okay. Um... Hillel was a woodchopper. Shammai was in construction. Yechanan was a was a was a was a um, it, it was a shoemaker. All these different rabbis had different jobs to support themselves, because so it's what very. Did what's you like, do? I play golf. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 has got to do something, right? You want to be a rabbit all day? No, he went to buses. Yeah, exactly. So the the um, it's very very hard to honestly be living in the world and totally disconnected. The Talmud discusses it. A lot of people think they can do it, but you can't really do it because the materiality of the world pulls you down to reality. Shubham Baichai was one of those guys who his entire existence was Torah. There's no other job. So for example, he didn't have to, I think he said about himself or someone said about him, he would say Shema like once a week. Because, because his whole entity was learning Torah, he was exempt from saying, from, again, we're talking about a man that was, even for us, it, 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 it's, hard, it, it's hard to understand. So now, now let's get, uh, let's get back, let's get back into what, what makes Rabbi Shem Baichai so special. We know there's something called Teshuvah. What's Teshuvah? Returning. That, that's the definition. Repenting. 
Thank you. Salam. Well, you wanted the real meaning. Mm -hmm. The real meaning. So, so the so in, in this when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai comes out of the cave the second time, what he didn't see people um, interacting with the material world. Well, all of a sudden he understood. Oh, there is value to reaping and to sowing. It's this, it's it, just like it was a waste of time before. It's a waste of time now. So why all of a sudden now? Sorry, is he more is he more tolerated? So normally there's teshuva. What does teshuva mean? I did something bad. And now I'm going to try to change. That means I have to move away from, uh, move away from the bad. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai was, was on a different level. Rabbi Shimon, Shimon Bar Yechai, he was able, he was able to, to overpower the opposition to, at, at their level, not to bring them up to his level. So look, let's look at how the Rebbe explains in text number eight. The Rebbe says, this is, this is a powerful text. So we'll read it nice and easy. Rabbi Shimon's approach was such that he didn't need to bring the entire world to, Shuv, to, to Shuv. Rather, Rabbi Shimon's approach tolerates a world still mired in a situation that warrants judgment to inappropriate behavior. Because if you remember the, the text, number, text number six, he said that I can absolve the world from judgment from the day I was born. So the, day, the world still remains still remains at, at, its, at, at its status quo. In a way, this is far greater than affecting change in the world where the lower par party is elevated and ceases being lowly. Namely, the evil is, is, is transformed. Rabbi Shimon goes a step further and says that godliness can reach and impact the lowest of places, even in the lowly state, the evil in, in its own natural habitat. Let's get Kabbalistic for a second. When the Kabbalists talk about God's infinity, one of the biggest problems is you have a finite world in, in, in God's infinite presence. So what did God do? He limited his infinity in order to create this finite presence, a finite um, world. That makes sense, right? Because comes, comes Chassidus and explains you're limiting his infinity. That means in God's infinity he has the ability to be finite as well. That's part of infinity. That's far, or that's part of almighty. God's ability to do all is the ability to be finite and infinite simultaneously. So yeah, you can do Teshuvah and you can elevate it. But Rebbe Echenon doesn't, so to speak, wait. He meets him at, 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 at his level. So you have, you, have different, um, you have different experiences in the Torah, right? So, for um, for example, let's take the story of let's take the story of Purim. Did, did Haman cease being a Jew hater? No, he, he was killed. Or sometimes you have another uh, another story, Achashverosh, where he was a Jewish Jew hater, but then he meets Mordechai and Esther. He realizes, oh, you know something, I won't be a Jew hater anymore. But there's a change, or, or ceasing to be. In the story of Yaakov and Esav, does Esav cease hating Yaakov? No. No, he still hates Yaakov. Just, he's so overwhelmed by Yaakov, the Yaakovness, the awesome, awesomeness of Yaakov, he, he, he hugs him. Going back, remember, remember, one explanation was that Esau kind of hated him less. Rishim Bechai says, no, he hates him the exact same, but at that time he hugged him. This is Rishim Bechai is. This is what Yaak, This is why Rashi quotes Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai. He's saying that Yaakov had this. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai got it from Yaakov. Yaakov has the same quality as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai to reach the lowest places and not change yourself, not change the other one. You are you, but because you're so positive, because because you're doing such amazing work, you overpower the opposition. So you see now, Yaakov, by the way, wasn't the run of a mill guy. In the beginning of this parsha, Yaakov sort of references, like I referenced that story of the demon. Yaakov just references a uh, a miracle. Most people, when they cross water, what do they do? We make a big deal about the the Red Sea, the Reed Sea splitting. That wasn't the first time water split. In this week's parsha, Yaakov's walking. It says, "You see over here, Kiva Makli, with my staff, I crossed the sea, I crossed the water." So Rashi quotes the. Um, the Medrash says, 
Akif came to the Jordan. Jordan. How's he gonna? How's he gonna get everyone across? Mm -hmm. He put a stick in the cross. That, that's who. That, um, that's who. Um, that's who Yaakov was. As the Rebbe says, Yaakov was accustomed to experiencing miracles. Where are we? Yaakov was accustomed to experiencing miracles. So though the rule is that Yaakov hates Esav, but Yaakov was so awesome in such a way that, that he, he was able to, to reach down to Esav, Esav at his level, that Esav should hug him. And Yaakov has this unique ability. Because if, if you look at text number 11, we know that pre, uh, this is not the first sibling rivalry. The whole book of Genesis is sibling, is sibling rivalry. Guys should read, guys should read uh, Jonathan Sachs' book, Explanation of the Book of Genesis. Very, very interesting. I think it's called Not in God's Name. Very interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Yitzchak and Yishmael didn't like each other, right? In fact, Yishmael wants to kill Yitzchak. That's why Sarah tells, excuse me, that's why uh, uh, Sarah tells Avram, you got to chase this guy away. He's going to kill our son. That's why Avram sends Yishmael away. But at the end, we see when Avram dies in the end of Parsha Toldot, we see that Yitzchak is leading the procession. Yishmael is 14 years older. So you would think he would go first. So if you look at you look at Rashi, text number eleven says we see that Yishmael did teshuva. He realized that Yitzchak was special, so he, he changed. Listen, yet when you have a father like Avram and you hang around him for a while, chances are you're going to turn out okay, right? You're hanging around Avram, Sarah. Good things are going to happen. So, but we see here the Yishmael changes. Do we have any record of Esav changing? Do we have any record of Esav doing Teshuvah? No. Not only that, you know what Esav's last act was? You know, you know, you know, you know, you know huh? His last act was he croaked. He croaked, right? <laughs> Do you know how Esav dies? You know this? Esav died in an act of defiance. So what happened was that Yaakov, Yaakov got, Yaakov bought the plots area in, in the cave of Machpelah. So when Yaakov died and the, and the kids wanted to and the kids wanted to bury him in the cave of Machpelah, the Asa said, no, 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 no. One plot is for Yaakov, one plot's for me. And Yaakov chose to give his plot to Leah. So his kid said, what are you, stupid? He sold it. Everybody knows it. It's in the book. Right? So he said, what do you mean? He sold it. You signed the document. Where's the document? Where's the receipt? So he said, it's in Egypt. Remember, Jacob died in Egypt. So I, I don't believe you. Bring you the receipt. So he was lying. I mean, so Naphtali is known to be very, was very quick. Naphtali is compared to a gazelle. So he said, Naphtali. Don had a son called, called Chushim. And Chushim was deaf. What? Chushim. Thank ah, you. Thank I appreciate you. that. Perfect. And he didn't understand. Thank you, Larry. Got me good. Chushim was that I didn't understand what was going on. So he asked, why, is, why did this whole funeral procession, whole funeral procession stop? So they explained to him, sign language, this or that, I don't know, whatever it is. Lip reading. Lip reading. That Asaph's holding up the whole, the whole Leviah for Yaakov because he's waiting for a receipt. Oh, yeah. So Chushim, no, no, so almost. Chushim said, my grandfather's going to sit there like a disgrace. Because this, for this liar cheater, so he went up the bat, he took a stick, and he hit Esau square across the head, and just, bam, knocked his head straight off his body. Chushim was mighty Casey. That's how Esau does. Huh? Grand slam. So it actually says Esau's head rolled next to Yitzchak's burial. And Medrash says, why did Esau's head bury Yitzchak? Because Esau always had tremendous respect for his father, you know. All his evil he hid from his father. He never wanted to bring his father um, hurt. Esav had tremendous... One thing you could learn from Esav, he had tremendous kibbedav. He loved his father. That's what, now, now we know why his father wanted to bench him. So, you see, in, the end of, in Pasha's told us, the relationship that Yitzchak and Esav have. Esav's crying because of the blessing. Yitzchak is crying because of the blessing, right? It's a very, very, very emotional... Um, it, it, it's one time you feel bad for the antagonist. Feel bad for Esau. But Ishmael does Teshuvah. Ishmael changes. Esau doesn't change. To the last day, he's Esau. 
But this is this is this shows the greatness of this shows the greatness of Yaakov. This shows the greatness of um, of Shimon Bar Yechai. This is this is what Rashi is saying. Let's look at text number twelve. It says ya- Yaakov did it. The Rebbe says like this: Yaakov didn't influence Esav to do Teshuvah. Rather, he was able to impact Esav in such a way that even while in position of a well-known tradition that Esav hates Yaakov, he was aroused um, with um, with compassion and kiss, kissed him sincerely. So, going back to the beginning, we we um, we always are going to have people who are against Israel, against the Jewish people against your observance. Sometimes the voice comes from within you. I can't, I can't go to Minyan, I can't wake up, I can't this. Or sometimes it's gonna be something outside of you, you know, you're archaic, you're ancient, you get with the times. Or, you know, some people are gonna say you're not the chosen people, or, you know, you stole the You know, you can, we can have a whole nother hour discourse or whatever it is. Our job is, is to is to do what we got to do, and when you got when you do what you got to do, then you, you totally overwhelm the Esav. The Rebbe said going to Israel. The Rebbe said, you know what the biggest problem that Jews in Israel have? We entertain these arguments for about the land. Don't don't entertain them. Stop answer, stop answering the question. Because what the past 75 years has shown us, no matter how many answers we give, and how many legitimacy, oh, you see, we're good people, you see, we do this, or you see, we do targeted attacks, or you see, you see, you see. Esav hates Yaakov. It's illogical. They're not looking for an answer. So, so stop. Stop wasting your energy. We got to do our part to, to strengthen Judaism and to mm-hmm. strengthen Israel. That That's our... And they, they'll scream, they'll rant, they'll rave, they'll hate. They're going to hate anyway. Think about it. People are protesting against Israel all over the world. People never even met a Jew. People never met an Israeli. What's your problem? We, I, I did something to you. Right? So, so, some, some old Jewish lady in France, right? They, they, they lit a fire by a door because there's mezuzah there. What did this old lady do to you? Because she believed? You know, like what kind of... Uh, but so the, the fact that Esav hates Yaakov is is illogical. So our response has to be it's really illogical. Just just keep going forward. And this, by the way, is the approach of Chassidus. Like I said, Shabbos is the is, is the Rosh Hashanah, the New Year's of of Chassidus. And what Chassidus brought to the world is a new approach towards dealing with the material world. Because until Chassidus, the, the, the outlook of, of a Jewish person was there's materialism and there's spirituality and there's a constant give and take, either I'm being more spiritual, more, material, more materialistic, and I have to choose one or one the other. Chassidus comes and says, and, and, and this is the whole approach towards Torah, towards alive and everything else. The material world, the ace of, you're not, you, you're not going to fight with it. What you're just going to keep doing what you got to do. And automatically, the Esau is going to come to hug and love you. And it will end off, like Jonathan Sachs said, the greatest line. Gentiles respect Jews who respect themselves. That's, Yaakov never, Yaakov never stammered. Yaakov it never, it never, um, we don't find over here that Yaakov says, oh, the blessings are really, maybe they're yours, maybe half yours. No, Yaakov doesn't hold back. Yaakov continues, and we are the children of Yaakov. We got to continue to do what we got to do. When that happens, the ace of automatically falls away and, and embraces us. Key points. Ace, uh, number one. Ace of hates Yaakov, but demonstrated love and compassion publicly. A, a, a weekend design. Um, it's, 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 how, how could it be? So Rishim Ba'ichai led a miraculous life and he was persecuted by the Germans, yet at the same time, at a different time, he successfully lobbied them to annul the decree. This reflected his lofty status by being able to neutralize opposition, but not trying to change them by just being a, a, a great expression of good. Yaakov too was accustomed to miracles, possessing the same quality of overwhelming the opposition. We can emulate this approach by neutralizing opposition with a strong display of conviction and, 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 and commitment.
That's what, uh, uh, that's what we need. We gotta be more Jewish, not less Jewish. So this year's menorah parade gotta be better, bigger than, than last year. I actually bought speakers, powerful speakers. We're gonna put on top of the car. We're gonna, more menorahs. We're gonna, everyone's gonna know. Am Yisrael Chai. While we're driving down the highway? Oh, not the highway, Pines Boulevard. Pines Boulevard? Yeah. Or, yeah, don't worry about it. Every, I've seen kids like you. They've got the big speakers in the back, and it goes boom, 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 boom. No, no, like no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> Questions, comments? All right, Michael J., please end, end the video. Have a good week, everybody.